Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire. For exclusive podcasts and more, sign up at Patreon.com slash Partners in Crime Media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, years after she left a brutal school for troubled teens, a filmmaker returns to the facility to confront its ghosts and its previous operators. We'll discuss the Netflix documentary series, The Program, Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. He's an idiot. Hi, Kevin. What was that all about? <laughs> I, oh, I know what you're talking <laughs> That's a reference to... He's something. obviously not an idiot. I'm certified. Certif- no, what am I? <laughs> sir, you're certified. Certified. <laughs> I'm certified. It's my favorite moment in the thing yeah. we're about to review. That's the only reason why I brought it into the intro. Also with I us... Am certified. <laughs> also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of The Final Curtain, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. I'm certified as a cat detective, so <laughs> true, I'm yeah. glad to be here. <laughs> you really going to lie in a church, Laura? You're going to lie in a church. <laughs> I mean, I, hello, do you remember the year that I was the Virgin Mary stand-in and the <laughs> yeah. nativity? Like, yeah. I mean, there's precedent here. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, our captain of all things cynical, the author of the City Trilogy, of novels, host of Strange Arrivals, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, the guy I always like to chase down at karaoke, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. So, Kevin, this is obviously Monday's program. That's obvious to everyone. What's coming up on Thursday's show? On Thursday, we're going to be talking about the podcast Varnum Town. Okay. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Well, we're living here in Varnum Town. We like train noises. And they're bringing all the cocaine down. <laughs> I wish I had time to think about that one. I could have come up with some lyrics, yeah. <laughs> they're bringing all the airplanes down. And they're bringing... Yeah. Ario Speedwagon. Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, so, Laura, the countdown is approaching to your big event of the year, is it not? It is, and I'm still sane, so that's saying something. Mm. Um, really? Is this event really like crazy making? Oh, uh, no, well, it's just, it's a lot of work to put on the Exeter Lit Fest, but the Exeter Lit Fest is now, yeah, less than a month away, just a few weeks away, April 5th and 6th in Exeter. We have a live Crime Writers On show adjacent to the Exeter Lit Fest, Saturday night, April 6th. And tickets are about halfway sold out. So if you want to get tickets, you should get them soon. Probably could do that. <laughs> is, it, is there a dry ice machine? <laughs> I do want me to get a dry ice machine. So it's really spooky when awesome. we come onto the stage. I want dry ice <laughs> and I want to walk out. <laughs> Can we have pyrotechnics? He wants a, he wants a little Stonehenge model. <laughs> Exactly. I want an 11 inch stone end bottle. I think Ben would go for that. He loves something out of the box. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Remind us the date. So the live crime writers on show is Saturday, April 6th at eight o'clock. And that morning, I think it's by the time this podcast comes out is going to be sold out the crime and mystery writers brunch at which we will be. And a lot of our listeners will be and some other local town personalities, um, along with a group of about 10 regional crime and mystery writers. Okay, so this is, yeah. I hate to say it, I should put this brunch on my calendar, that is what you say. <laughs> you should, yes. Okay, because I keep seeing emails about this brunch and Slack messages, and I'm like, oh, it's so nice for Laura that that thing is sold out. And I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to be at that? You're supposed to be there, because you are a regional crime and mystery writer, okay. and we are going to play a game of Two Truths and a Lie, my most favorite game. Was I supposed game. to buy a ticket? Because I didn't do No, that. you're you're an invited guest. Oh, and I just got a sponsor. I see. To pay. I literally just got a sponsor today who gave me a ticket that's paying for the brunch costs of all the authors that I've invited. Got so. it. Got it. So okay. Rebecca's two truths and a lie. I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> <laughs> 
I didn't know where it was, and I didn't want to do it. So, which are my two oh, truths? Oh no, I want to do lie? it. I just didn't understand why I kept getting messages about it in Slack. I'm like, why is Laura giving me the updates on this brunch situation? Good because for her. Because all our listeners are going to it. Cool. So. I mean, good for them. Yeah. But anyway, all yeah. right. Well, now I know. I can't There'll wait be for biscuits brunch. and gravy. Biscuits and gravy at the brunch. Um, mm. I thought that was kind of a heavy thing, but I guess it will sustain us. Through lit Fantastic. Oh, yeah. All right. I hope they uh, built a nap into the lid. That's going to be a long day for us. Just like a little peek into our lives. This is why Kevin quit his job a few years ago and works for us full time so that I know what the hell I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> make it sound like I'm your assistant. <laughs> no, but you do make sure shit's on my calendar. Yeah, shit's on your calendar. <laughs> I got in touch with Dale in case we need a little pick me up later. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Barnum Town. All right. Yeah. You need some of that Coke from his Christmas tree? Yeah. <laughs> Keep it in the laundry room with his sheets. Or from his laundry room. His, his white Christmas. <laughs> okay. Our EP is save, telling me to get on with it. Save it for the next podcast. <laughs> okay. Our EP is telling me to get on with the topic at hand. <laughs> right? Is that what that signal yeah, means? Yeah, that's what that signal is. Go Let's on. go ahead and drop that first clip and make Kevin happy. Let's go ahead and do that. Leading off. You sent me away to a place where I was vilified and told I was the problem. I was a kid. Concerned by her adolescent behavior, Catherine Daniels' parents sent the teenager to the academy at Ivy Ridge, a school that promised to set her straight through a rigorous program. But within its walls, Ivy Ridge's students were subjected to humiliation and violence at the hands of its staff. I really don't want to be here right now, but I'm here. I'm fucking weirded out. I'm uncomfortable. I'm, yeah. I'm shaking. Like, well, fuck this place. Yeah, fuck this place. Years later, Catherine and her former classmates returned to the now closed school. Riffling through its abandoned files and surveillance tape, they put together the pieces of their traumatic experiences, hoping to prove to an unconvinced world they were abused by so-called educators, more interested in collecting tuition than in their well-being. I keep thinking after all these years of looking into it, you'll get to the bottom of it. There's just more and more and more, and you just keep finding out more characters, more connections, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The Netflix documentary series The Program, Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping is a unique view of the troubled teen industry told through the eyes of a former student. Catherine Kubler retraces the Academy's history while confronting former workers and pursuing current owners. She also attempts to come to terms with her own experiences at the school and her strained relationship with the parent who sent her there. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about significant plot points from the program. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. An important additional note, I am the host of Netflix's You Can't Make This Up podcast, and I interviewed Katherine Kubler, director of the program, but I promise that has not influenced my review. So Laura Bricker, we should say there's a lot of archaeology going on in this documentary, headlamps, <laughs> uh, masks, and digging through actual real-time evidence of what happened to Catherine and her, uh, I, I hesitate even to call them classmates, they're really sort of fellow survivors of this place, Yeah, at this building, which has been basically abandoned and has everything that was there when Catherine and her friends went to school there. What did you think when you saw the amount of stuff that still exists in this building? I could not believe that they just left everything there. In the beginning when I'm watching and I'm like, this is like a war zone. It's like a place that's been bombed and everybody escaped. And now they're like, let's go back after the fire and see what remains. That was, to me, one of the most effective parts of this documentary was the fact that they're going back to this place, this like house of horrors where they were, you know, I'm going to say imprisoned. And it's all still there. The beds are there. The books in the library are there. I did not need to see the snakes slithering away in that scene. But the fact that all of the files were still there, it was Amazing, but it, it reminded me of that scene and like in the dark when Madeline Barron and they're out like digging through boxes and court papers with like you know rat poop and stuff. When she, they, like it's like these people just got sucked up into outer space. Like what happened to them? Yeah, this is like a Stefan from Saturday Night Live should jump in. Is like this building has everything. 
Abandoned files, pithy graffiti, sweatshirts, highlights of abuse, children left on DVDs, yeah. dad skirts, <laughs> snakes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty uh, incredible, right, yeah. Kevin? Yeah, no, the building is amazing. It's like, you're right, Laura, it's like the rapture happened. There's like everybody vanished. They like ran out like Chernobyl. Like they just left everything behind. But to find all that, pay- like they thought this was just paperwork. This is really an evidence trail. I do wonder about the graffiti that was there. It was really great and poignant, but it, like, how did it get there? And like, you know, was that something? That, was it a contrivance of the filmmakers, no. or did some other people come in and yes. have like really thoughtful things to spray paint? That's you know said well, daddy come, issues or yeah, whatever. This they comes were, out yeah. a little bit in my conversation with Catherine that we had, right? So the building was actually discovered many years ago uh, by some like internet treasure hunter type people, and then one of the guys who's in the film that she made actually was going to the building a long time ago, and other people were going, and he invited her to come see it. So oh. yeah, so she didn't discover this abandoned building. It's actually owned by like a Chinese company who bought these buildings for development and then never did anything with them. That's so weird. Yes. So they're just sitting there. It's pretty incredible. And I think the moment where she finds her own file is pretty astonishing. Catherine Daniel, real mom died of breast cancer. Yep. That's always my introduction to people. Before I was two. Oh, this is like my words. Had had a lot of nannies. Dad remarried at age seven. I was really happy. Then it started turning horrible. So, Toby, one of the things that I think makes this documentary stand out, when I first started watching this, it's like, to me, like the documentary analog to, in in some ways, like a Dan Taberski podcast, not because of who the storyteller is, which we'll talk about, but because of her writing for herself. And, you know, you heard me hint about it in the intro, but Catherine will write these incredibly snarky and funny and like pithy things to say in her own VO and then actually back it up by showing us a thing that she has on tape. And she's got a lot of footage of herself when she was a kid. Like she'll talk about her horrible stepmother and then she shows us footage of her horrible stepmother. She'll talk about the guy who ran the school being an idiot And then she'll show us evidence of him being an idiot. He couldn't spell or write a complete sentence to save his life. When a parent emailed him concerned about the quality of education at Ivy Ridge, he replied, All of our teachers are New York State certified. All of the therapists are certified as well. I'm sure that response was reassuring. So what did you think about that? Just her narrative voice here. Well, it's interesting because it's sort of, it's on two levels, right? I mean, one is she was a victim of this. So it's all sort of first person. And I was trying to think of what have we seen that's been like this? I mean, we've seen a bunch of things where things have happened in people's families, but in terms of having firsthand experience with the institution and then going and making something, sort of an investigative piece about that institution. The only thing I can think of was telemarketers. But what's different about this is like she's just a really good artist as far as this stuff goes. Like you were saying, like she's a very good writer. You know, certainly they must have had hundreds of hours of stuff to go through and the way it's edited and put together is very compelling. She has this sort of group of friends or whatever you want to call them, but people who shared the same experience, who go through it with her, all of whom, you know, they all have like slightly different experiences and slightly different takes, but they're all very in their own way able to talk about them in very sort of impactful ways. And I I don't know anything about her other than at the very end, they kind of show her getting some awards for films, it looks like. So clearly she's very good at what she does. And the fact that she happened to go through this and decided to make a movie about it or a documentary about it, I don't know. I thought it was extremely, extremely rich in a whole bunch of different ways that I think Either somebody who had just experienced it or somebody who was just a really good filmmaker wouldn't have been able to combine all this. The first 15, 20 minutes, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all this. Like, this is just going to be really, really rough going. But it's actually, when it's over, it's like, oh, okay, well... (laughs) Is there, you got through it. Is there going to be a season two? Because it, you know, it was so compelling. Yeah, it's compelling. I mean, she manages to make it extremely watchable in large part because, I mean, I think in talking to her, I also discovered her sense of humor carries over in her real life. And she says it's like, you know, people went through sh- shitty stuff. 
you learn to be funny because you went through shitty stuff. Mm-hmm. But you even see her as a kid before she went into this thing. Like, she was funny. She was a filmmaker. She was a person who was making media of herself doing fake news reports and, like, you know, messing around with her sister. Like, it's, I mean, I've, I'm curious to see the kinds of things she would have made if this hadn't happened to her anyway. But Laura, I mean, don't you think just that sort of wry sensibility, the ability to be funny, the ability to in the moment make decisions like, hey, let's put on all these Ivy Ridge clothes and do a whole scene wearing the stupid fucking clothes that they used to make us wear all the time because it would be a great visual for the film and also show how fucked up this was. Like, that's a good filmmaking decision, but also very poignant. Oh, absolutely. It's like her intuition in terms of like what will work and and won't work and what to do next really is strong in this. And you see it even when she's interviewing and she's just so good at interacting with people on all levels. Like even when she's having that breakfast at the diner with the woman that was like the mean woman that was at the counter that was like always cracking down on everybody. She's not a dick to her. She's kind of like, yeah. So after the first year, I said, this ain't a boarding school. This is a fucking prison. Yeah. I'll tell you what, this food here is better than Ivy Ridge's food. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how you can eat that. I I never ate a lot up there. I mean, she knows how to get people to talk in a way that she's not putting them on the defensive. And that's a skill. I mean, when you see somebody that has the ability to do that, to be able to, even though you are the victim in this and you are the survivor of this, be able to go back and question those people. You know, there were some things I wasn't so sure about. Like, I was like, I don't know about the karaoke thing. Mm -hmm. that to me, I was like, what was the point sort of, but that was really the only thing where I was kind of like, eh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, (laughs) I'm with you on that. Cause it felt like what, you know, other than, you know, being entertaining. Yeah. I'm not sure of the purpose of crashing. What would have been the point of confronting him though? Because he just would have said a bunch of bullshit that would have ended up in a Netflix documentary. Well, well, then why, then why uh, approach the reverend in church when you can't even see him? When he's just, and what that guy is just a pawn. That this is the guy at the top. So I just felt like a pulled punch. Uh, or it, it, it had a little bit of Brian from S Town, where he's like, "I'm not feeling it, even though I came all the way here to confront you." I'm with you, Laura. I was like, I think that you could have stepped up and done something. Although singing one way or another to the guy's face is kind of funny. the Justice Department or FBI, there's nothing I can really do to the Litchfields, except this. But don't get too comfortable, Narvin, because one way or another, I'm going to get you. Making him think that he's in a documentary about karaoke when you're actually filming, he actually got him to sign a release yeah. saying you're making a documentary and then putting him in this thing and catching him in his glory. Yeah, punking him, I guess. I, I don't know. What did you think, Toby? I mean, I thought it was just supposed to show after... You know, essentially three hours of seeing these these adults who had these incredibly damaging years, months or years at a place that this guy was sort of intimately involved in. And his obviously, clearly, he is not haunted by this in the slightest. Like he's just, you know, he's doing karaoke and taking it seriously and has a bunch of people. And like this is clearly like a big moment for him. I, I thought the contrast there. And I mean, she does spend some time sort of talking about how, you know, there there was no empathy for these kids. Like these kids were just being used as a way of making money. But that I I kind of felt was sort of experientially. It's like, look at this fucking bozo. Like this is a guy who's making tons and tons of dough off torturing these kids. And he just doesn't give a shit. You know, he's off doing lame karaoke and thinks he's a karaoke stud (laughs) and like does videos of him practicing karaoke at his house. It's like absurd, but it's also infuriating because it's like this guy like lacks the capacity for kind of self-reflection about what what is sort of enabling this lifestyle. I mean, that's what I kind of got out of it. Yeah, I I got the same thing. And I I think that also just like, what is he going to say? He's just going to deny everything. You know, you know what he's going to say. He's going to say, I won't talk to you or he's going to deny. And she has all the goods on him. Like, just tell us the goods and then show us his stupid face with his stupid dyed hair and his. I don't want to point out the one issue. I, I have. A, I think this is really great. I don't want to harp on the one issue that I have with that. But that's the point of going, Rebecca. 
I mean, if journalists just go, I know what they're going to say, then what's the point? Well, you know what? And, the- and what are you never going to actually, maybe he says something yeah. in the moment. I mean, certainly to prove the point, the reverend did. Yep. You know, so I just feel like that was a missed opportunity. But you wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to join us on Patreon. No, you wouldn't. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how much you spend in tuition. There's always, always an five, extra six, few bucks a month. Always a, f- a few extra bucks a month. <laughs> You don't really care about Paramount Plus. Drop that shit. Join <laughs> us on Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com slash partners in crime. You already Media. watched that horrible Yellowstone. Come on now. <laughs> By now, we have over 500 exclusive podcasts on our Patreon that you can get, including early and ad free episodes of Crime Writers On. You'd already have uh, known where we come down on this podcast. Other great things we have is the CWO After Show. Yes. And Rebecca is going to get all crowned up. Yes. What are you talking about? Oh, we're going to talk about what's happening. Like, literally, my favorite week on Twitter that's happened maybe ever in the uh, wake of photoshopped photos of future Queen of England and where the fuck is she as of this time of this taping. And we're also going to hear from an expert on the media around the royals, too, around this. It's very exciting. Uh, We also have great things like Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Toby's next book is The Assassination of Fred Hampton. Toby, who's going to be talking to you about this great book? I'm going to be talking with Alex Segura, Chris Joyner, and Deb Shudica. Yeah, have you uh, started the book? I've downloaded it onto my Kindle for the plane tomorrow. That counts. Mm. So we're taking steps. Sticking with the Kindle. All right. What are you shaming a Kindle for? The Kindle's good for these things because you can just highlight... And at the end, you just sent yourself a list of all your highlighted stuff, and that's where you figure out your questions. No, yeah, I don't mean to shit on the Kindle. I do like the Kindle. But I, my Kindle is like so old that I, th- I think that I have like a charger that doesn't fit anything except the first yeah. generation Kindle, something like that. I, I, I do have like a hermetically preserved <laughs> Kindle charger somewhere. I, I read Kindle stuff on my iPad. Yeah. Like, yeah. like a proper yeah. old person. I have it on my phone. Yeah. I have my <laughs> I have my books. And then I take pictures and video with my iPad too. Like a proper old person. <laughs> nice job, Grandma. <laughs> T- Toby isn't the only one who has a book club. Laura Bricker has one and she talks about it in the latest episode of Leave It to Bricker. What is the name of your book club, Laura? It is kind of a tongue twister, Kevin. It is the No Rules Book, Gun, Saber, and Smut club yeah sounds great the smut part especially <laughs> the smut part is super fun um and saber because, i mean you actually meet you that's not a euphemism for something right no that is okay. because we have a member uh, who is sommelier who can saber off the top of bottles of champagne and this book club which will be the night that this after show happens he is bringing a sword to chop off the bottle Top. So that's going to be even more exciting than yeah. the knife that we All used right. at the last book club. Next, leave it to Bricker, the Lose an Ear Book Club. Yeah. <laughs> has its next meeting, <laughs> the, the Vincent Van Gogh Book Club. <laughs> Good luck typing your notes with nine fingers, Laura. So. <laughs> All right, Kevin. Uh, does thus end the business section? Yeah, thus ends the business section. I'm going to go ahead and fade that music out right now. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. Disney Plus and Hulu are better together in the Disney Bundle with new movies and series. On Disney Plus, experience the full Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, Taylor's version, with new main show performances and acoustic collection. On Hulu, follow the fantastical evolution of Bella Baxter, played by Emma Stone in the award-winning film Poor Things. All of these and more streaming this month. Get the Disney Bundle with Disney Plus and Hulu. Terms apply. See DisneyBundle.com for details. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Lara Bricker. Yes. What do you think about a, an abusive institution 
that not only leaves behind video documenting its abuse, but edited video documenting highlights of the most abusive abuse that happened at that institution. Because that was, in Are fact... Are you talking about the NFL? No. Because they do that every Sunday. That was, in fact, I was able to confirm what happened. Catherine did not have to watch thousands of hours of abuse and, and come up with a reel to show her friends. That was how she found it. DVDs with highlighted the most abusive things. And they, they don't know why those DVDs were made that way. What do you think was going on there? Do you have any ideas? Um, training videos? I don't know. I mean, that's, it's, it's just startling to hear something like that because at face value, you would think, why would you want any of this documented? But in hindsight, when you hear from the people that were there and you sort of really get a sense of the, you know, prison-like institution setting that this, this was, the people that worked there and the people that were the administration there, they like felt totally entitled to be doing what they were doing. Like they had, so I can see how in that sort of twisted logic, I think that's just further confirmation of how fucked up these people were that they're like, this is totally cool. This is like the best of real or something. Like, I don't know. Did they sit around at night and watch it? Like, I don't know. Rebecca, remember when you got in a kick on that one? Get me another beer. I suspect someone was fixing to become a whistleblower. Maybe. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, it could have been a whistleblower situation. It also could have been just a documentation situation. We don't know. Could have been something somebody brought to their poker night and said, hey, let's throw in the greatest hits of our hits and, uh, you know, laugh at it. You don't think any police departments have, like, things of our greatest takedowns? Yeah. I mean, I... I I, I think once once you buy into that culture, I think you celebrate again the greatest hits. It's like look look at this. Yeah. Look at me take down this kid. Look at this asshole. I ran his head into a wall. Yeah. One of the things that's really interesting, Toby, to me is that Catherine interviews all these former employees who worked there who live in this small upstate New York town. We're talking like upstate New York. Uh it is Ogdensburg. Yes, it is Yeah. You go to Syracuse and you drive two hours yeah, north. It's and it's, it's into really up. Yeah, people, I think I don't really have a conception of like how big New York State is. But New York State is very big and upstate New York, there is nothing there. It's like, on the Canadian border. Yeah, it's it's really bleak, too. It's like it's like nothing. Yeah, they get like eight feet of snow. Yeah. And it's just it's, like, it's crazy. Yeah. And so she talks to people and, and I think does a very good job painting a portrait of this community and like um, explaining why it is that these people would be excited about being employed at this place. And of course, they didn't require any certifications or training or, you know, special degrees or anything to become a quote teacher or, you know, administrator or whatever at this place. They were just offering an hourly wage job that was a little bit better than working at one of the local businesses that was, you know, maybe not hiring at the time. And then these people just following the program turned into the monsters that these kids we're living with. And I think that she handles that with a lot of sensitivity and like logic. Toby, what did you think about those interviews? Because she certainly could have handled them differently and wouldn't have gotten, I think, us the sort of full picture of that that we that we got, I think, in this documentary. Right. I mean, one of the things I like about her as an interviewer is that she's I mean, she's not unfriendly. I mean, she's friendly when she's interviewing people, but you also like, <laughs> at least I felt like I could detect an edge, you know? You know, I think that's one of the things about this whole industry that I think this kind of answered for me to a certain extent, which is how do you get people to kind of buy in to this sadistic methodology of controlling these kids? And it comes out in two ways. One is with the interviews with people, and then the other is she kind of has this little piece that she does with, with some more information. They have that interview in the diner with that woman who's basically like, oh yeah, I was a bitch, mm -hmm. you know, I followed everything. And then you later hear that one young woman, what was her name, Diana? The one who was there for like two and a half or three mm -hmm. years and nobody could break her. And she talks about how this woman like literally like threw her on the ground, sat on her chest and like basically made her almost unconscious and then started trying to force pills down her throat. So anyway, she talks to this woman and this woman is just like, yeah, I mean, that's the way it was. And then she talks to another woman who was like, I followed the stuff like it's as best as I could, knowing that it didn't really comport with my values. So I, that that was interesting. But I think that outside of the interviews where she kind of lays out this thing, which is Ogdensburg is in the middle of nowhere. 
you know, it's got a limited number of jobs, which clearly is not enough to employ the people in that town. So that's an attractive place to put a school. So you, you hire these people who really don't have anywhere else to go. And then she talks about like the Stanley Milgram experiments, which I'm sure most people have heard about where essentially like if you're given a role and given things that you're supposed to do and, and sort of given a certain perspective that you will eventually fill that role. And that's just kind of human nature. And Milgram did it with students and said, you're guards and you're prisoners. And they took on those roles like very, very quickly. Although I think there's some questions. About yeah, there are some, there are some point, questions but, about that, but still, yeah, <laughs> but, but it sounds good. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I think that's kind of what happens and you hear it from the woman in the diners like, well, these were the rules. So I enforced the rules and I had a pretty heavy hand. Yeah, There's a lot of acknowledgement of that, but you know what? I don't hear any apologies for what Kevin, they're just doing their jobs. <laughs> just doing their job. Yeah. yeah. Following orders. Well, speaking of apologies, huge through line in this series is Catherine's relationship with her dad. And she makes the decision to estrange herself from him for the same amount of time that mm-hmm. he put her in the school. And now this is many years later. This is she's an adult now. And she makes this decision and she's just not going to speak with him. And, you know, we see this series of communications where he's like, just talk to me. Just talk to me. And she's like. You're just going to have to see what it's like when I don't. And then they have this very awkward conversation on camera that sort of evolves. You, you wrote in your letters. I can read them back to you. I'm, you know what? They, that's something you and I are in agreement on. They, those programs, and this is why I'm with you on the programs, they manipulate parents. And once, uh, I'm so sorry, Catherine. I am so sorry, sweetie. Well, I thought that that was really moving, actually, you know, because what, you know, I think I think that her distance from her father isn't just like punishment for him. I think that she is unconsciously testing whether he will come for her this time because he didn't last time. He actually obviously he's trying. It seems like he doesn't get. It or he doesn't get all of it. It's, certainly, she still feels in the beginning, kind of, kind of frustrated. But you know that is the trauma that she had, and she's trying to work through it. And we see that you know towards the end in that last discussion that they have, that he seems to better express his contrition, and she seems more willing to hear it and to continue their relationship hopefully in a in a better way and we've seen that with some of the other people that she visited there was that one mother who was talking about you know like when she finally came to understand what was happening with her daughter like how regretful she was and even the we'll call them the students they recognize that what happened with their parents is they became indoctrinated into a whole different kind of cult which was just Okay, you know, you're desperate. Just keep giving us your money and things will be good for your kid. And so Come to our seminar. Yeah. And the system is set up so it's like, you know, it's like, oh, well, they're going to tell you things are awful. Don't believe them, even though they're awful. Right. And it's like, oh, things are awful. Well, we know you were going to say that. So it's like the more they complain, the better it is. Give us more money. I think Catherine was super right to be pissed at her dad. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I think her, her dad chose his wife over his kid. Because the wife clearly was like invested in getting the daughter out of the way. And I don't think that she was testing him to see if he would come for her. I think she was just not ready. And I think her making the film and having him watch this on the film was her way of saying, like, let let me show you what you did to me. And I think that's what she needed. Well, I think for, both things is what I'm, is for I'm him, trying to say. Both yeah, because yeah. when he did, he kept trying to come for her and she was just not. The conversation was just fucking, I mean, that Laura, that was hard to watch, right? I mean, I'm, I have a estrangement from one of my parents and that was very hard to watch and like in a way that was very moving. But at the same time, like I was not like necessarily saying like, Catherine, you need to forgive your dad. Like I was like, I was kind of on her side about the estrangement. I mean, it, it was rough, right? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I was estranged from my father for the last 15 years of his life. And it was it was rightfully so. And so I can really relate to watching somebody in their own life now trying to look at how is she going to handle this? How is she going to approach this? And she's really doing it in a way that she's looking out for herself and what she needs to be able to move on from the situation and process the situation and doing that in a way with her father that I felt like she was kind of holding him accountable, but it was really awkward to watch the conversations. 
It was also kind of a weird setting, like when she was just kind of sitting out there with her little microphone going back and forth. I think the setting, <laughs> uh, the way that it was being filmed, didn't help with making it seem less awkward. At least there wasn't a camera crew there. It was like her little camera was propped up like on a chair. and she It was. Would, yeah, I mean, I think that it was just how she did it because there wasn't other people there, you know? Yeah, but it's, it's interesting because of the way, you know, to see like the parents having been so programmed by the program and not being able to, even though it seemed like he wanted to, in a way, not being able to get out of the loop of what they had been told about this program that they sent their kids to. Because then guess what? They're going to feel like shit when they realize what they actually did to their kids and they're not ready for that. You know, they're not ready to take that responsibility and that accountability. Right. Uh, Toby, I found myself wondering if her dad is still like an evangelical Christian, because clearly she grew up in a really church centered household. Right. And she talks about that. She actually went to a private Catholic school on Stony Brook, Long Island. I know exactly the school that she went to because I used to see it when I went to college there the first time. Uh, Very cloistered little school kicked out for drinking a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah. And that's why she got sent to this incredibly horrible prison of a place. And then we hear about these other families that also for essentially religious foundational reasons, you know, when that's how their moral code was founded and then sent their kids away, including the family, by the way, that sent their perfect daughter there in order to become closer, to bring their family closer together because they had sent their son there and they wanted her to have the same experience. Wonderful. What, what do you think of sort of, again, we, we talked about this again and again and again, the, the religious undercurrent that sort of drives people to these quote unquote non-solution solutions? Yeah, to me, I guess my biggest criticism of this whole thing is that that was kind of teased a little bit, but not really followed up on at all. Uh, you get like these moments where she refers to her evangelical upbringing and then you see, you know, the people who run this are, are I'm, I'm pretty sure LDS. They are. I mean, he, yeah, they've got like 15 kids or whatever. And it just feels they mention it enough that you kind of wonder like what the thoughts are about it. But she doesn't actually try and draw any lines for you. She just kind of leaves it out there and she doesn't even do it enough that it's kind of like draw your own conclusions. It's just like these little facts that get dropped here and there. I don't know. You know, I've got like little theories about why this might be the case, but they're not really based on any kind of evidence or whatever. It's just kind of an impression when you talk to these people. What seems to happen with like some of these parents is the sort of authority that the people running these schools are able to project and sort of competence and like, we will do things that will help your kids in ways that you clearly aren't able to, or or feeling too overwhelmed to be able to attempt, you know, what, what is it that allows parents like that to be like, Oh, okay. Like, that's awesome. Like I couldn't really wrap my head around as a parent at that school. They had one really nice room where they took their parents and had a meeting. And then the whole rest of the place, like you walked in the entrance and it was fine. And he went to this one meeting room and that was nice. Then the whole rest of the place is a piece of shit. And nobody, no parents are like, oh, can I take a look at like what room can I see where they sleep? Sally's going to be staying at? You know, it's just no, like, it wouldn't be good it for seems the program. Like, can I no. see the riot hallway, please? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like, it seems like the due diligence that you would do as a parent just to check out the environment that you're sending your kid off to, knowing that it's going to be extremely restrictive. Like I wouldn't send my kids to a college without like checking out a dorm room. Right. That seemed. But that's part of the program, right? They probably sell it to them that way. Like this is their kid's space. And if they complain about the space, they're just trying to manipulate you into getting you to take them out. It was very much like in good. This reminds yeah. me of like nursing homes a little bit in a way. Cause I, I haven't gone through putting my grandmother into a facility at one point. It was the same thing. They have like a pretty room. They show you downstairs, <laughs> but same room. thing when you, you move grandma and they're like, she's going to call and not want to be here. And, it's part of the process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, t- Toby, I bet I, I, I was watching the riot scene and I'm like, it's amazing that they have footage of the actual riot scene too. And I was like, I bet Toby is really loving this riot <laughs> scene. The kids smashing yeah. the light bulbs. and <laughs> <laughs> There's a movie to be made, like a fiction movie to be made about all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's like disturbing. I think there's also, I mean, you can't really call real life things metaphorical, but I think you could turn it into a, uh, a pretty strong metaphor in a in a fiction movie. Absolutely. Well, one thing I want to address real briefly before we wrap it up, Toby, a question you had. And as soon as I saw this scene, I'm like, we got to talk about it. 
In Goond, I had a big problem with the fact that the reporter pretended to be a parent and called the kidnappers and, uh, you know, sort of impersonated a parent to get that information. So, Laura, I just I want to ask you this question, Laura, because you also had a problem with it in Goond. What did you think about Catherine uh, doing it in this documentary? You know, it's interesting because I felt like in this situation, and I was actually thinking about that as this part was unfolding, it didn't bother me. And I was like, why isn't this bothering me like it bothered me in the other show? And I feel like it didn't bother me in this case because of who Catherine is to this documentary and this story and the fact that she lived through this. And just the way that she like called up and asked the questions, part of me feels like, okay, that was a little bit, but By the same token, it felt like it fit in the story here and it didn't stick out to me as something that felt like, oh no, I'm going to be really upset about the way they handled this. It just, I think because of the fact that it was her story, it felt like it was more appropriate. Well, I had the same reaction when Toby, when you asked me to compare it to Navalny, Navalny was investigating his own murder, his own attempted murder. Catherine's not a third party journalist here and a third party journalist could get that information a multitude of ways. So could Catherine. But I guess emotionally, like, it just didn't strike me the same way. I don't know. Toby, did you have an issue? Because you didn't have an issue with it in Goond as much as I did, right? Yeah, I don't really have an issue with it in either. But if there are ethics to it, it seems like they would apply universally. And the fact that somebody seems more responsible or somebody has had a different experience or whatever doesn't, to me, seem like that doesn't really apply in most other things. Mm. Like, if there's ethics... Whatever. Like, I don't have any strong feelings about it. I just thought it was kind of interesting. It's an analog, Because it does seem, it seems more palatable when she does it, definitely. But whether there's an ethical difference because of that, like, it didn't seem to me that way. But I didn't have much trouble with the first one. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. Disney Plus and Hulu are better together in the Disney Bundle with new movies and series. On Disney Plus, experience the full Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, Taylor's version, with new main show performances and acoustic collection. On Hulu, follow the fantastical evolution of Bella Baxter, played by Emma Stone in the award-winning film Poor Things. All of these and more streaming this month. Get the Disney Bundle with Disney Plus and Hulu. Terms apply. See DisneyBundle.com for details. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, (laughs) That's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Okay, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know. What do we think of the three-part documentary, The Program, Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping on Netflix? Laura, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for The Program? Yeah, this is a big thumbs up for me. We've obviously listened to and watched other media about the troubled teen industry. This particular telling done by Catherine, our host and documentary maker, who was actually one of the survivors of the facility that is profiled in this documentary, really takes us to the next level. She is both funny and vulnerable and very thorough in the way that she investigates and goes back. I I mean, I think for me, one of the most powerful parts of this documentary is that so much of it was filmed with Catherine and other survivors of this program in the actual facility that they were sent to. And that was really unique. And it really put it in a whole different light. I found like watching this, I was thinking about the therapeutic value for these people who are participating in this documentary, going back to this place and be able to process what happened there. And I think it really brought all different sides of this place into focus from the people that worked there to the management to the teenagers who went there, to their parents who sent them there. And, you know, I hope, as I say, every time we watch something like this, I really hope that this gets attention and people realize they should do their homework before they send their kids off with goons in the middle of the night. So big thumbs up for me. Toya Ball, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for the program? I'll start off by saying that uh, at the beginning, there's a little uh, disclaimer 
that says, you know, so, so, you know, this shows this, this, and this, it might be disturbing to some viewers. Like I would like to meet the viewer who isn't at least somewhat disturbed by the stuff that goes on in this. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I was trying to think of a documentary, uh, a, a TV documentary that we've watched in the almost 10 years we've been doing this that I liked more than this or that I thought was better than this. And I don't, you know, nothing really sprang to mind. Um, So I know I'll, you know, get off this and be like, oh, I should have thought of that one or whatever. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's definitely like a sort of top three or five, like easily documentary that I think we've covered. I, I, it's hard to imagine that it wouldn't be the top one or two at the end of the year uh, for me. It's, I mean, I talked about this a little bit in the main review, but I, it's just unusual that you have a person who's both an experiencer of what happened and then is also like, you know, I don't know what her background is, but she's clearly a very accomplished just based on this artist. So you put the two together and I think what really comes out is, is sort of, it just succeeds on a lot, a lot of levels. You know, we've done a lot, also done a lot of stuff with the troubled teen industry, right? And we've we've looked at some really good things. I think this is sort of head and shoulders above everything else, both as sort of a factual accounting, but then also getting to a more sort of human level of what the uh, consequences of this are. I could go on and on and on. I'll just say I just super, super highly recommend it. You know, there's some stuff in it that's tough to get through, but it's important. And it's not even close to in any way being sensationalized. Like the stuff that they show that's disturbing or may seem like a little extreme is absolutely appropriate given who's making it, the way they use it, the reactions that you see from the people who experienced it at the time. It's just put into such great context. Anyway, I mean, this is just like one piece of what makes it excellent. So anyway, huge thumbs up for me. People should definitely see it. Kevin Flynn. I'm also a huge thumbs up. I mean, we have done several of, of these in the in podcast form. Goond, Sent Away, The Sunshine Place. So the the outlines of what is happening in the industry may not be new to uh, many true crime fans. But this is the first time we have seen any of these kinds of reports from the view of a student, former student, someone who can really demonstrate their experience articulate what happened to them and what they're feeling today. Catherine is definitely the center of this piece, and she's snarky and funny, and it's just like you want to go and uh, have a Mike's Heart Lemonade with her. She really invites people to be a companion with her on this this difficult journey. Her attempts to not only put her own life back together, uh, her relationship with her dad, but also find out a little more about What's going on here? So it's just visually, it's just really compelling. Yeah, I agree. This is going to be in the in the top 10. Definitely. It's really going to set the standard for any kind of documentary or, or other kind of uh, media involving um, the troubled teen industry. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I would watch the movie where they dramatize what happens here. And hopefully at the end, there's a happy ending a la The Breakfast Club. Wouldn't that be sweet? So anyway, I'm going to say it's a big thumbs up. Yeah, same for me. I'm going to agree with Toby. This is one of the best documentaries we've watched in the history of us making this podcast. I actually very much liken it to my all-time favorite first-person documentary we've ever watched on this show, which is Murder on Middle Beach, because Madison Hamburg, like Catherine Kubler, was a student filmmaker, a young filmmaker, when he started making that documentary. He started making that documentary when he was in college. I don't know if you guys remember that. And then throughout the documentary, the quality of the film got better and better and better because he grew up. He became an adult, (laughs) right? Catherine Kubler made this over a 10 year period. Right. And then she became professional film editor and she like did more and more work. And you see a lot in this documentary. And one of the most incredible things you see in it is she has video receipts for almost every single assertion she makes about her own experience. So this isn't somebody who is saying things like, you know, and it's in the trailer, so I'm not spoiling much. I got sent away to a, a basically a prison camp for drinking a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Like, 
She's got video of it. She's got the letters to prove it. She has everything about her own life. And like that kind of first person documentation combined with her innate likability is just an extraordinary combination. And the thing that she does here, which is so incredible, and the reason I'm comparing it to Murder in Middle Beach is because she brings in other people who are central to the story and includes them in the storytelling process to making sure that they sort of have their full due and they get their full time and they get their full perspective in. It's just extraordinary. It just like it's when I describe it to people, I'm like, I'm telling you to watch this thing, which is going to sound really grim, but I guarantee you are going to be very entertained by it. Like it is so freaking compelling and so good and you're going to want to watch episode two and then you're going to want to watch episode three like it's just fucking great so i just cannot recommend this highly enough i love the program i cannot wait to watch everything that katherine kubler makes and just like congratulations to everybody who had their hands on any part of this now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast a little something i like to call The crime Crime of the week. week. When Johnny Lee of San Francisco was troubleshooting his slow Wi-Fi, he found the device that was hogging all the bandwidth. It was his washing machine. Lee got the LG smart washer so he could monitor its progress when he did the laundry. But the machine had been sucking up more than three gigabytes a day, enough to stream high def videos for an hour. It was unclear what kind of data the washer is using, but the app requires access to personal information like date of birth, location info, and even photos. It's also unclear whether that data is being sent anywhere. Oh, that's not unclear. (laughs) Lee thought the situation was funny, but privacy activists are not laughing. They see it as another example of how customers' data is being collected without their knowledge. Also, security experts have warned smart appliances like thermostats, light switches and doorbells don't have the same kind of security as laptops and iPhones, which make them more susceptible to hijacking. LG says its washing machines are not designed to use three gigs a day and are looking into the problem. Panel, that's a lot of online time, even for a major appliance. What do you think this washing machine has been doing on the Internet, Lara Bricker? Um, I think that this uh, washing machine is into day trading. (laughs) (laughs) So, Toby Ball, what do you think this washing machine's been up to on the internet? My first question, people can tweet the answer to me if you do this, but why do you want to know the progress of your washing machine? <laughs> I have I have a smart dishwasher, Toby, and it dings me. Do and tells you? Are me, you just like, oh, yeah, it's in the rinse cycle yeah. and that yeah, feels good? Says, I don't know. Well, but the problem was it wouldn't hook up without the app, so I had to get the app, so now I have no choice. You know what else lets you know when it's done is the beeping noise it makes mm. when it's done. <laughs> that's, that's the thing I find most useful. Um, yeah, porn. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. <laughs> What do you think, Kevin? Soap operas. <laughs> oh, very oh, funny. I think it's shopping on eBay for all the matching socks for those single oh, socks yeah. that it ate during those Ooh. loads that it did when only one sock came out. You know what I'm talking about, Kevin, right? Yeah. All right, Laura Bricker, if folks want to reach out to you and say thanks for going not dirty and letting Toby have that swing about the LG washing machine, how can they find you online? They can find me at Laura Bricker on Twitter and Instagram. What about you, Toby Ball? How can you be found? At Toby Ball NH. What about you, Kevin? What if people want to find you? I'm a Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show everywhere at Crime Writers On, including YouTube. And I encourage you to join our incredible, amazing, wonderful, supportive community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. Seriously, you'll make friends there. I swear to God. Just go to our regular Facebook page, find the pin post, hit join the group, and then we'll let you in as long as you know literally any one of the four of our names. Get episodes early and ad-free at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll also get the Crime Writers on After Show, Married with Podcast, Laura Bricker's Leave it to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the terrific Livy Burdett. The executive producer of this program is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in the Treehouse Yoga Studio above the Mockingbird Cafe in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi Studio, otherwise known as Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire based where we also sing karaoke with our arch nemeses. On On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. Speaking of how's your mom? (laughs) Kevin.
Nice. Ew. <laughs> I can't just take that out. There's, there's your was, What was that? What, what just happened? What just happened? What did it even mean? <laughs> I know what it means. You know what it means. <laughs> I'm pretty clear on that. Too. <laughs> Congratulations to everybody who had their hands on any part of this. All right, let's do what we do. All right, now it's time for my favorite. <laughs> let's now- do it again. <laughs> Media. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil.